first, when I started this, I was like, but I'm not going to have all the answers. And so what am I going to do? You know, and I don't have all the answers. And, and then the veterinarians are receptive to that kind of collaborative effort, like you said, knowing that, you know, they don't have all the answers either. And we're going to work on it together. And it's a team effort. I'm going back to fond memories in this episode because Dr. Amanda Ardente is a consultant nutritionist for zoos and aquariums. She started working as a veterinary technician at the North Carolina State Veterinary School. She then became the student and into a PhD program in comparative nutrition. Our conversation goes from fun animal stories to how Amanda had to balance career decisions and her family. We cover a lot of ground, so let's get this episode going with Amanda Ardente. I'm really excited to be able to dive into your career adventure because <laughs> we align a lot on some of our interests. I still remember, you know, standing in my trailer in Auburn, which if you, anybody out there who went to Auburn, you understand you live in trailers, it's just the way. This is the way. Um, <laughs> but I was standing in my trailer with all the hopes and dreams of, of working with aquatic animals, zoo animals. And I don't even remember how I came across you, but I, you were so kind to get on a phone call with me and talk a little bit about the unique part of that profession. And so- yeah being able to dive back into it, I'm, I'm pretty excited. So now I was looking at your LinkedIn and you went to vet school at NC state, correct? Mm -hmm. I did. Um, did you grow up in North Carolina? I did not. No, oh, I grew okay. up um, outside of Philadelphia. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. But I moved to North Carolina with the intent of maybe going to vet school someday. And, um, I was a technician at the time. Um, and knew that I didn't want to spend as much money as it costs to go to Penn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And maybe wanted uh, a more reasonable tuition um, with and to get residency in the state. So I kind of like looked around at the closest um, in proximity and picked North Carolina as the place that I was going to go. So, yeah. Very nice. So you were, you were being strategic there. Now, <laughs> did you, did you know early on, like, when did you know that you wanted to get into veterinary yeah. medicine? I'm one of those that has like the kindergarten document <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with veterinarian written out, poorly spelled. Um, but yeah, I, I never wanted to do anything else. I went the technician route um, because honestly, I was just scared of the schooling um, and the science and the math, shockingly enough for what we do now um, in the nutrition world. But I wasn't sure that that was going to be the right fit for me. So so I went the technician route and I was like, I can be in veterinary medicine that way. And I loved being a veterinary technician. I loved the patient care aspect of it and really getting to, um, to hone in, you know, on, on the patient. I was specifically interested in um, critical care. So um, again, just very excited and very into being sort of bedside, you know, with that patient. But then when I was at, I actually worked at the vet school at NC State. Uh, as a technician in the ICU, then worked alongside of the vet students. And I was like, hey, I might be able to do this. <laughs> so nice. let's give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that that's really interesting that you were able to work with the students in the school before you actually became in their shoes. Yeah. So once you were in their shoes, what was that experience <laughs> like? What was it like for you going through vet school? I went through, I feel like a lot of like I, I guess most students probably do, like a lot of personal metamorphosis, you know, like yeah. I, I went through it all, the, the gamut. So, you know, got into vet school and thought that I for sure wanted to be an ICU clinician. Like that's what I knew as a technician. I saw the residents working, you know, and I was just super, that's what I, that's what I was going to do. But I always had like the inkling that, you know, zoo was also, I liked the exotic um, side of things. So um, I decided to just keep my options open, not be too narrow minded and explore all of the clubs, you know, that were available to me, um, and all of the like extracurricular experiences. So through that, I kind of veered away from critical care and, uh, down the zoo path. So, 
Yeah. Okay. So a little different for me that that was my original interest and Uh and I picked it up along the way. Is there, was there like a, a a fun animal story in that time that kind of told you, Oh yeah, that this, I like this. You know, I just, I love turtles. It's they're like near and dear to my heart. (laughs) My thing. (laughs) So, um, tortoises, turtles, sea turtles, it doesn't matter. All all of those um, guys. So um, I started working with the NC State has a turtle rescue team uh-huh. um, under uh, Dr. Gregory Lubart. And I became just like obsessed with all things turtle related. So, so getting involved on those cases and like rescuing wildlife and being able to experience the like rehabilitation sort of of that animal, fixing them up to the point where they were ready to be reintroduced. Um, that was, yeah, that was, it got me hooked. Yeah. They are definitely a fascinating species. I've done some <laughs> rescue rehab of, of turtles as well. And uh, there's nothing cuter than a turtle eating. Oh, awesome. Okay. So you, you got onto the zoo track uh, there. Mm-hmm. And so what was the transition out of vet school into this field? Cause I, I know you did a PhD. Is that, was that after, yeah. during, where did that come into? After, Yeah. After. Okay. So once I knew that zoo was going to be more my focus. Um, then I kind of, it's all about like who, you know, right. And talking Mm -hmm. to people who are in the industry and what you have an interest in. Right. So I just started talking to people and figuring out kind of the best course of action. And honestly, it seemed to be that zoo veterinarians, and I think it's still true. There are few opportunities out there and you have to kind of be willing to go where the jobs are. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Family is important to me and I want to, I knew I didn't want to have, be able to, to have to cast that big of a net, right. To find a job. So I was like, there has to be another way to get into this field without going the beaten path, right. Of internship, residency, zoo vet, right. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. So I met Dr. Uh, Lanahan. So he is an astronaut veterinarian, veterinarian who also was an astronaut. I ended up being in a car with him, taking him to an airport on a, a trip that I had as a student, an externship that I was involved in. And I just had so happened to be in this car with him. And he's a fascinating person, right? Like any, any veterinarian who also then is in NASA, like that's pretty, pretty incredible. So I was like, I just want to pick your brain and find out like how you did these things, you know, how did you get to where you are? Kind of like what you do right, yep. right now, you know, like, how did you do this path? How did you come up with this path? He said, the biggest piece of advice that I can impart is to find your niche in this profession, to find your thing, right? So like veterinarians are generally tasked with being like a jack of all trades, right? We're taught everything, every species, infectious disease, medicine, surgery, you know, population medicine, individualized medicine, like it's all there, right? As our basis. And so he's like, so now you have a choice on how you you know, proceed and you have to pick your thing and then you can make your impact, you know? And I was like, Ooh, I love that idea. And I need to figure out what that thing is, you know? So it's funny in the car. Um, I was also with three other students, um, two of them ended up becoming ophthalmologists who also, um, they picked their thing and ophthalmology was their thing. And they, uh, do small animal and do zoo alongside of it. And the other went the path of aquatic veterinarian. So she did specialize, you know, in, in just aquatics. So, so anyway, that that, was a very inspirational car ride. Yeah, right. (laughs) I know. Surprisingly. Yeah. After that point, I just, it just kind of got my wheels turning. Right. And I was like, okay, so again, I don't want to be, I don't want to have to cast that wide net and go wherever the jobs are. I want to be able to work though in this field and I need to find my passion in that field. What's going to be my niche? Where can I make my impact? And then I was on a clinical rotation um, at the Sea Turtle Rehab Center on Topsail Island uh, with Dr. Craig Harms and had the experience of being able to figure out um, a nutritional based problem there with the sea turtles um, at this center. The issue ended up being something that was pretty uh, simple. The diet that these animals were being prepared was uh, that of filleted fish. And by taking out 
the bones, you know, these turtles weren't getting the appropriate calcium intake that they needed. And so they had these inverse calcium phosphorus serum ratios um, that actually were leading to like delayed healing um, of their injuries. So it was like my eyes opened right at that point. It's like this ah moment, you know, where <laughs> it was like, I can do something impactful, right? And it's, and it's relatively simple, right? But figuring out the nutrition and it was like a, a clinical problem, right? That had a very, it was very clinically applicable um, in the end. And so that's kind of, it kind of got me going down, down the nutrition path. Nice. And yeah. so is that when you decided to do a PhD to continue going yeah. down nutrition? <laughs> so, so then I didn't really know what I was going to do at that point because veterinarians who want to specialize in nutrition are generally guided the residency route, right? Yep. And, but that residency route is very much small animal focused. I wasn't sure that that was going to be the right choice for me. I wanted something more comparative. So I just went to meetings, um, zoo meetings, nutrition meetings, and I talked to people about what's going to be the best option. What's going to make me competitive in this field? Who are my who are my colleagues going to be, you know, because there aren't really any veterinarians doing zoo nutrition. It turns out my colleagues are primarily masters and PhD trained animal science, you know, on the animal science path. Um, and so getting a PhD was going to put me in a better position to, to sort of compete with them for the jobs that are out there on the market. So the PhD was the way I decided to go. Yeah. And you're yeah. right. Cause it got you there and look at me, yeah. I did not go that way and yeah. I'm not there. So, uh, <laughs> yep. I got yeah. to a PhD as well. PhD. And, and that's okay. We I was all told by one individual PhD and boards. And I was like, mm, probably not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. pick different ways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And your, your PhD, I mean, to me, I think it's the coolest thing because you, you did get to work with dolphins. And so mm-hmm. how did you come across <laughs> your topic for your PhD? I'm very fortunate. I feel like it literally was just placed in my lap. (laughs) I chose, it it was like the right time. I was in the right place at the right time, you know, and got hooked up with the right people. So I started my PhD at the University of Florida. Um, Their aquatic animal health program is funded by the state. And so um, it's one of the rare opportunities to have a funded PhD. (laughs) Yeah. Um, stipend. Um, I did have to come up with the research money, but um, I was covered. So that was huge. And then in the aquatic department, Dr. Mike Walsh um, was my first contact and he had a particular interest in nutrition. Um, He's an aquatic veterinarian. I, you know, met with him literally on my first day of the PhD program. And um, right then and there, he called the veterinarian at the Navy um, and started talking to him about, I have this PhD student sitting here in front of me. She's interested in nutrition. We've been talking about nutrition things. Let's, let's make this happen, you know? And that was (laughs) the first step and everybody bit. And it was again, kind of right time, right people. Yeah. I have this uh, PhD student, give her something to do, please. No. Yeah, give her, yeah, exactly. <laughs> please. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then I needed to convince the nutritionist at Florida um, to be my person, to be my primary mentor, because I needed, I needed to be guided by a nutritionist. Right. Um, right. And so Richard Hill is the nutritionist at UF and he, he is hard <laughs> to win over, um, especially because his focus is not aquatics. So I did a lot of persuading, <laughs> but eventually got him, uh, got him to bite. And I think he's pretty happy that he did. So Oh, that's really cool. So what was the, you, so you were working with the Navy on a nutrition project for dolphins. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So dolphins under uh, human care tend to develop a kind of kidney stone that dolphins in the wild or free ranging dolphins um, tend not to develop as readily. So as you know, a lot of kidney stones, your, your lithiasis, all of that is largely diet-based. Uh, there's a diet foundation, you know, to that problem. My investigation was into what's different between the diet that they're eating, um, in the wild versus the diet that we are feeding them, um, under human care. And is there a connection, um, between that diet and the development of these stones? I I like that when I was working in the zoo nutrition world, um, yeah, I, yes, I was going through a residency that was focused on cats and dogs primarily, but there are a lot of comparative pieces to it. Oh, so yeah. it yeah. is, yeah, it's really exciting to, uh, you know, have a, 
it's like a puzzle, right? You're trying to fit the puzzle together. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very cool. So now you're a consultant and you get to work with all sorts of zoos and aquariums across Mm -hmm. the, at least the country. I'm sure internationally, you've been able to, to help some different zoos as well. Going back to the, there are not very many veterinarians in this space. Mm-hmm. I mean, even small animal <clears throat> nutritionists, there's not that many of us. Yeah, right. So do you find yourself feeling isolated at all? Or do you feel like you have a pretty good network? I think because the zoo nutrition community is so small, I've been able to network with those individuals, um, at, again, at meetings, different courses that I've taken um, in my postdoc at Disney. Um, I was able to be under the mentorship of um, their nutritionist. And I think they're a very open group of people and very supportive and willing to um, provide their mentorship um, and through their different experiences. So I think um, I do feel really supported. It, it is isolating to work at home and, you know, be sitting in front of the computer and all day long and staring at spreadsheets, but but when I have a question, I always have somebody to reach out to. If I want to talk through a problem that's just like circling in my head and I need to find a way out, you know, I can reach out to any one of those uh, individuals in my little niche community <laughs> yeah. and uh, everybody will be willing to help, you know? Yeah. The thing about zoo is a lot of times we are making things up as we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think we're all very interested to learn. And I think it makes it a potentially very collaborative environment. Yes. 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 And Mm -hmm. definitely from the veterinarians, they know that there's, uh, they, most of them, I feel like have some sort of awareness that there's a gap in their training, right. Where they need the nutrition, um, advice and expertise. And so they're welcoming, you know, that input. And they also, at first, when I started this, I was like, but I'm not going to have all the answers. And so what am I going to do, you know, when I don't have all the answers and, and then are the veterinarians who are bringing me in going to think, well, this girl doesn't know what she's doing, you know, but I found that if I, if I'm honest, right. About like, I don't really know about that because we don't really know about that. Right. In this species, we don't really know. And so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. If I'm honest about that, and then use my resources to like pool together the information I can the end product ends up being, you know, something that helps move the problem in a forward direction. So, and then the veterinarians are receptive to that kind of collaborative effort. Like you said, knowing that, you know, they don't have all the answers either and we're going to work on it together. And it's a team effort. Yeah. yeah. They understand that answer of, well, we don't know that. <laughs> so, no. Yeah. <laughs> we can roll with that. Got yeah. It. Exactly. Well, very cool. And I know uh, the the group, one of the groups in Zoo Nutrition is the Nutrition Advisory Group, so mm-hmm. NAG and AG. So if yeah. anybody is interested in looking up that group, they're uh, very fantastic. Their meetings are always fascinating. For advice for people who might be interested in, in a direction, in, in this direction, whether it's zoo or more exotic nutrition, anything like that. What are some of the the best pieces of advice you think you would give? I think again, it's like, it's all about the, the people, you know, who are already doing it and they've, they've been there and they've gone down a path and it might not always be the same path. And I think you can learn so much from talking to those individuals and how they got to kind of where they are now. So going to those meetings, you know, there's, they're cheap student memberships, you know, that you can be a part of and, um, and have the opportunity to be in the room with these, you know, brilliant minds and people who have gotten to where they want to be and be that person who asks a lot of questions like Megan did. And like I did, <laughs> yep. you know, and don't be shy. I think that's kind of the biggest thing too. In this, in this small field, you can't be a wallflower and get to where you need to be. So, um, I think you have to put yourself out there and be willing to do so. Yeah. I think that's a good piece of advice for many areas in um, just life in general is don't be afraid to talk to people. Be curious seems to be my motto right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Do you have like a, a fun story that, I mean, you've got to have like a gazillion fun stories with all different (laughs) species, but um, is there one that just kind of stands out that would kind of explain some of the things that you get to do? 
I mean, I've had some pretty fun experiences along this path. Everything from, you know, being able to be on a boat while on my PhD, like people joke that, you know, I had the most fun PhD because essentially I fished for my PhD. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I went out on a boat a lot of the summer and caught fish um, that the dolphins, you know, are were eating. That was always a great adventure and time, you know, doing these big purse sign nets and dumping them out on this boat and collecting the fish that I needed, but also getting to see all the, you know, and doing these research surveys of the Sarasota Bay. It was pretty an awesome experience. And then being able to go to these facilities that have dolphins and work with their veterinarians. I've traveled to Atlantis a couple of times during my PhD to work um, at Dolphin K. Um, they have a, um, a population of dolphins there that had some health issues, you know, and I was working again with Dr. Mike Walsh and, and troubleshooting their nutrition um, for that purpose. So getting to go to a, a beautiful island, a beautiful resort, um, that's pretty awesome. That's in I the worked, Bahamas. It is yeah, gorgeous. Bahamas, yeah. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did. I got the opportunity to go over it. So people I met actually, again, all about who you know and network with and talk to the people that worked at um, Atlantis went over and then worked at um, the Singapore Aquarium. Um, so I got to go over there and work with them to on their dolphin population and their, again, their nutrition, but then um, was able to kind of get into their aquarium exhibit and um, snorkel with the manta rays. I mean, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> and, and a little terrifying because they're so giant. Yeah, so I've had, again, like some fun experiences that this position has uh, afforded me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, research projects, uh, again, continuing along that path at Disney, I was able to work with rhinos and looking at rhino poop. So I played a lot in big piles of rhino poop, <laughs> yet not so glamorous part of the job. <laughs> yeah. So yes, if you're a small vet veterinarian out there and you think you've got poop problems, wait until yeah. the rhino. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Wait until you're playing in a pile of rhino poop. <laughs> so. Yeah. Do you ever come across people who struggle with the idea behind aquariums and zoos? Mm. I think being a zoo vet, you, you get a very unique perspective into yeah. the world of these animals and yeah. especially in captivity. So yeah. do you get a lot of those types of concerns and questions and how do you respond? Um, huh. that's a good one. It's uh, a hard, I know. I, it's this real is, hard. <laughs> Yes. So I would say I, I, thankfully, because I'm on the sort of back end and I, you know, work with the teams that are actually on site, they're having to deal with these questions a whole lot more than I am. So, mm -hmm. but I think these animals, we are so fortunate to be able to have them, to be able to learn from them, observe them. I know my kids have like seen things that they would never be able to see, right. And probably their lifetime, you know, some of these animals that they've gotten to experience and, um, I think that that's invaluable for connecting us who are so far removed from our natural world with the natural world that's really out there, right? I think without them, there would be an even bigger disconnect between, you know, us and all of the other beings that inhabit this planet. And so I, I think they have a place, right? And, and the people that are working at these facilities, I know there's like a lot of controversy out there about our intent and all of that. And across the board, everyone's heart is in the right place, right? For these animals, like that are working in a reputable aquarium or zoo, they are, everybody is out for the best interest of that animal, for the individual animal and the long-term health and welfare of that, of that individual. If you have that passion um, and that genuine sort of selfless interest behind it, you know? Yeah. So I think it's a tough, it's tough. And I go back and forth sometimes, like I will freely admit that there are times where I'm like, is this, is this the right thing to be doing? But, or should we have the bigger species in these um, exhibits? But again, I think in the end, probably some of these species are going to be around for a long time, right? And again, my kids are probably never going to, I don't know, potentially never see a black rhino, right? In, mm -hmm. in the wild. And so if they get to appreciate and experience this amazing species, I don't know. I think uh, it's a pretty special, special thing. I have seen people get just as connected and close and emotionally attached to these animals as oh. I have with cats and dogs. Oh, 100%. They, so yes, I, I think 
for me, a lot of my interest too, I think was, I did have such a, a heart and a curiosity mm-hmm. around nature Yeah, and yeah. these animals do allow us to learn a lot and be connected to nature, no matter where you live, you yes. get to appreciate this. And I always say, there's got to be an education component to these, oh, yeah. these facilities and these animals so that we understand that everything we do impacts the world in a much larger way. Yes. And yeah. it, we need to look beyond our own tiny little bubble. And mm-hmm. I, they, I think are a constant reminder, at least it always was for me and just yeah. how amazing these creatures are. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that the world is bigger than just our, our bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we need to be reminded that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Especially, Especially now, today right? when we're yeah. stuck yep, yeah. inside. Yeah. Moving back to you, you stated that one of your values was family. Mm, and yeah. so how has that also maybe impacted some of the decisions <laughs> you've made along the way? Yeah. Um, well, uh, my husband is a equine surgeon. Um, so he also chose a pretty small niche uh, in this field. <laughs> it's funny. We were both finishing our PhD. He also did a PhD at the University of Florida. And um, we were both finishing about the same time. I was finishing my postdoc and he was finishing the PhD. And we were both like, all right, who's going to take the lead to like get the job, right? Because we both have very specific careers now. And like somebody's got somebody's to lead the way. And so I applied for some stuff. He applied for some stuff. And it ended up his position mine, the zoo world is not known for paying a whole lot of money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and especially the zoo nutrition world. So his path was going to be the one who led us to some financial stability to be perfectly (laughs) honest. So we were like, okay, you've, you've got to be the one to take the lead. I had to then figure out what the heck I'm going to do, you know? So you take the lead and now we live wherever your job is. And so how am I going to make this happen for me? So I always wanted to work with the smaller facilities um, that probably wouldn't ever be able to hire a full-time nutritionist um, to be able to help them improve the nutrition of their um, animals' diet plans. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start this company and uh, hopefully there's a market for it. Again, I talked to a lot of people out there, veterinarians and nutritionists, and kind of polled the audience, if you will, um, to figure out, you know, if there would be a market for this, there seemed to be a need. So I was like, okay, here we go. I'm going to do it. While that opportunity gave me the ability to follow, you know, if for lack of a better term, um, my husband to where his job needed him to be. So that has been good for us and a compromise that worked for our family. And then I started a business and then had kids. So (laughs) that has been a challenge in and of itself. I got late. I had a late start to the game of uh, veterinary medicine. You know, I was a technician, remember, for a little bit. And so I worked in the field for just three years before I even started vet school. And so I started everything kind of later. And then vet school plus an internship plus a PhD, like, um, yeah, so it takes up your life. Um, And eventually I was like, okay, well, clock's a ticking. We got to get moving with the family if we want to go. So, um, so it all had to kind of happen at once and we just embraced the chaos sort of, uh, and made it happen. So yeah. So the two kids have been a, a blessing to both, you know, my husband and I, and, and then again, the ability to have a job that's remote has the flexibility, um, has allowed me to, to kind of be able to manage both as well as I can. <laughs> yeah. Some days is good and some days not so good, <laughs> but uh- I mean, you, you're very entrepreneurial. I don't know if you would consider it that way because I just talked with you and I don't know if you'd yeah. be, you, you would take credit for it, but uh-huh. I really believe you are. And so, you know, this has come up a couple of times with some people I've talked to about being a woman in this profession and it does take a lot of time and it can be very stressful mm-hmm. and, you know, people have had to decide do I push the ideas of family back? Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for mm-hmm. other people in just veterinary profession in general around mm-hmm. family and, and trying to find values and make decisions with their mm-hmm. career? That is so, so difficult. And I think it's so individual and personal. Yeah. For me, I, I wasn't sure I even wanted a family, so it wasn't 
that wasn't a driving force for me, at least early on, you know, in my career. And so I let the career be the guide, you know, for how my life was going to go for a while until again, it sort of the pressure came on of time. And I was like, okay, this is either going to happen or it's not. And so, you know, we need to make some concessions if, if we want this to work. So I think making that choice is just it's really hard and it puts, and it puts women, you know, like right now, what 80% or some odd of women are veterinarians are women right now. Like it's, we predominate, you know? And so it has to be a part of the conversation as we continue along the vet school path. And when you're making those decisions about internship or residency, PhD, like it all takes time. And, you know, I know some women who were able to have children during their PhD, a couple during their residency. And I think you know, that's where having the support of your family extended and your, you know, significant other is essential, you know, to be able to make that happen, um, to do both, you know, things at the same time. So I've really wanted to, you know, grow my business, but I also need to take the realistic perspective that I'm a mom and that's important to me and being there for my kids is important to me. And so as much as I want to push and grow, there's a realistic timeline, you know, that I have to do that within. And so I think that's been hard for me who, you know, a driven person who is passionate about what I do um, to have to like pull in the reins a little bit and have a a more realistic view of, of my life as a whole, right? Because it's a whole picture and how are all these puzzle pieces going to fit together? So yeah, Um, I'm not sure that that gave anybody any advice, but (laughs) No, that was just perfect. know you're not alone. <laughs> yes, decisions, you know, that is yeah. one thing you're not alone uh, to look at it holistically. Career is just part of yeah. our lives. It's very mm-hmm. important part. It's a big part, of, but it's not the only part. And so I think mm-hmm. incorporating everything when we're making decisions is important. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to add to that. Yes. Having family support is important. Mm-hmm. So is having friends and colleagues support us too. So I, oh, I think, yeah. oh yeah, a hundred percent. That's another yeah. thing that, Absolutely. you know, even if you are someone who doesn't want a family or, you know, children or, or whatnot, yeah. Yeah. We, we need each other. We need to yes. support each other. And lift each other more. up and continue yes. pushing each other in positive directions, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think there's a, a real tendency for everybody, but especially in this, you know, little world for us to, to judge others and their paths um, that they've chosen and, and then look at maybe how that might be impacting us or our life. And if that's making our life more difficult, you know, because of X, Y, and Z. Um, And I think remembering that that person has a story, you know, and is a person with their own set of values um, and respecting that, respecting each other enough to give that space. Absolutely. Well, I want to make sure that everybody knows who would come to you. Like, who are your people? So if somebody needed <laughs> help, what, yeah. what kind of help do you provide? Could it also be maybe a, you know, a cat, dog, veterinarian, but a lizard walks in or. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 Who um, call you. So I, I tend to work more with um, veterinarians and again, like zoos and aquariums are, tend to be my focus, but I've worked with um, pet owners of exotic um, animals, pet owners of dogs and cats as well, potbelly pigs, you know, like they're, they're all, all of the species, right? It's a comparative nutrition consultancy. So I can kind of uh, take it all. I would, if it's a pet owner, um, I would encourage you to have your veterinarian Uh, in on this process because it all relates, you know, back to each other. Uh, The diet and the health of the animal are all, again, interrelated. So it's important that that person and I are on the same page, but I'm happy to work with pet owners um, themselves as well. I've worked with universities, you know, who've reached out, like their zoo and wildlife department has reached out, small zoos, backyard zoos, larger facilities, you know, yeah, it's kind of, I kind of run the gamut. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, I think we talked about this. I definitely see a growing interest in having pets of different species. So mm-hmm. for, I'm sure veterinarians will appreciate knowing that they have resources when yes. something a little bit different walks in the door. So. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, 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 for sure. Well, yeah. fantastic. So just reach you on your website. Yeah. Um, okay. Yep. The website's a good spot. Um, provides my phone number. Um, there are forms that you can fill out there to provide more of the diet history and animal history. And then always, you know, you can contact me via email on that website. Fantastic. Well, I'll make sure to link all of that um, in the description below so people know how to reach out to you. So awesome. final four questions. I'll give you a moment to breathe just before, okay. you know, these hard oh. pressing questions. <laughs> all there right. Oh, so the first one is what is something that people get wrong about you? Oh, I have a very extroverted side, but I also really enjoy my time <laughs> and having, and I do have an introverted side. And so I think, how do you put it? Like the term, like the being on, you know, I'm pretty good at like being on when I need to be on, but then I do need, do you need that downtime and breather time to kind of regroup? I'm a bit of a mix between yeah. the extrovert. I, yeah. I think they call it ambivert. I'm the same Ooh, way. Oh, I like yeah. that word. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> totally get that one. Mm -hmm. All right. And what is a, maybe a hidden skill or interest that you may have? Oh, interest, I guess. I really enjoy being active, working out, um, running and like cross training sort of classes, being outside in general, hiking, mountain biking. We're very an outdoorsy family. So mm -hmm. brilliant and active family, <laughs> whole, whole rounded there. <laughs> And what's something on your bucket list? Oh, oh, I'm going to say this and <laughs> I'm getting ready. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, get ready. So I really, I've always wanted, wanted to go on one of those shark dives off of Cape Town, um, South Africa, you know, like diving with white, great white sharks. Like yeah, in the, that's on the bucket list, like in a cage. Oh yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Although now I'm like more fearful than I used to be. Like as you age, I think you tend to like think about these things and you're like, hmm, is that the smartest move? You know, um, that's really smart. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's still on the list. It's still there. All right. We'll get you on Nat Geo yeah. wild or something. <laughs> yeah. like, Put her in the cage. <laughs> yeah, nice. And finally, what is something you're most grateful for? Uh, I'm going to be probably redundant, but I'm going to say my family having a supportive husband and, and these kids that really do like bring light to my day every day. Yep. And the support of my parents, um, my sibling. Yeah. Having a good close network of extended family too. Thank you for diving into another episode of the Vet Life Reimagined podcast with me, Dr. Megan Sprinkle. I have quite a few exciting guests to bring you in the queue, so make sure you hit that follow and subscribe, and I'll be here for you next week.